That's why you see the so common story, childhood star loses his mind, ends up in jail, is drug addict. The devil lives so strong. It's temptation, it's vixens, it's drugs, alcohol. This is fucking, this is dark, it's intense. I had this panic attack of like, what the fuck did I just do? Who was that? Who am I? Where am I? Why am I here? It's easy to get lost in that world, and I did. There was this character that I was portraying. It's the YouTuber disease. It's a completely different world. That trauma can create superpowers. It's a double-edged sword, and just learning how to wield that sword of like, you know, I can use all of this for good. And it's gonna let other kids who maybe were scared ride along with me and maybe start to feel the courage. If I'm gonna lose tens of millions of dollars, I don't give a fuck anymore. Jake Paul, good to see you, brother. Good to see you always. Always, man. I wanna let people know my perspective on the real Jake Paul. And I feel like I have a unique perspective on that because I've seen you under the bright lights. I've seen you in the back rooms behind the bright lights. I've seen you prepare for those epic nights that everybody just gets to see what the whole world gets to see. But I've seen behind the scenes there. I've seen you in the Maloka when the candle goes out and it's pitch black and El Dragon starts singing his Icaros or playing his harmonica. I've seen you in those moments. I've seen you when you pull in the full lung capacity of Bufo, 5-MeO-DMT, and I've been right there with you in those. We've been through God Bomb together. Yep. And I've seen you just fucking around, having fun. Yesterday we're out, we're throwing knives and throwing axes, and you're figuring it out, and then you get this idea, and you go, when you start throwing the knives, you go, death by knife! <laughs> and then you just start sticking them in. <laughs> I needed that. You, you needed death that. Death by arrow. <laughs> now, then we got the bow and arrow, death by arrow. And then I just realized, maybe this is a thing I do, because I just started shooting the basketballs, and I was like, please, please, <laughs> please. Just willing it. Yes. Just, just willing it. Willing to, it into willing existence. Willing it in. So, I mean, I've seen many of the aspects of who you are. And also, I haven't seen a whole bunch of your old YouTube content either. So, like, I feel like I've seen, like, a cross-section of the man that you really are and the man that you really are now. And I can't speak to the man that you were, but I imagine there's a continuity of self that's carried you this way. And so it's kind of funny to me when people have all of these snap judgments and thoughts about who you are. And I'm like, y'all don't fucking know who this dude is. Like, you have no idea. Like, I've been there on the inside, and it's a much different thing. Well, thank you. Yeah, and um, each day, humans evolve. And you could wake up one day and shave your head, change your name, and get a face tat. But you could yeah. also do that within yourself and within your spirit and within your heart and within your mind. You can literally change who you are overnight. And I think I've been in media for so long and creating videos for so long um, that people see a lot of the old stuff. And I was, I was cringe. I was immature. I was a young kid uh, with, you know, big dreams and big aspirations. I wanted to make my family proud. I wanted to make a bunch of money. I saw my dad, you know, crying because he had to sell everything. And he came to me and like, it was, it was super emasculating. He was like, I don't know what yeah. to do. I, I can't afford anything. We're going to have to move. We're going to have to. And, and he was so weak and he, I saw how much it hurt him that he had to sell his motorcycle that brought him so much happiness mm -hmm. after a divorce. He was lonely. Yeah. So I wanted to make money. I wanted to be, you know, the first successful person in my family. And, um, you start to do things based off of getting to this goal you have in your mind of like financial freedom and success and fame. And you think that's going to bring all the happiness and change everything. And as a kid, that's what like really motivated me. And I was in Los Angeles by myself at 17 years old. You know, my older brother was supposed to, you know, be the one watching over me, right, right, then right. I'm, I'm the one watching over him. Right. And 
it's a crazy world out there. You, the, the, the devil lives so strong in that city. It's mm-hmm. everywhere. It's temptation. It's vixens. It's drugs, alcohol. The devil always hides in the holy, and it's hilarious that it's called the city of angels. But the devil's hiding there in the city of angels. The devil hides in all of the holy places. Exactly. Because of course, <laughs> exactly. you know, as long as it can slip underneath in the holy places, then it can go undetected. Yep. And uh, and that's that's definitely there, man. I mean, you can feel the especially some of the emptiness and hollowness. I, I grew up in Southern California too before I moved to Texas at fourteen. Spent a lot of time back there. And some of the most challenging energy I've ever felt was when I worked for a production company in Hollywood. And I was like, whoa, yep. this is fucking, this is dark. Yep. It's intense. It, it really is. And, it, and it'll break you down mentally, especially as a, as a kid. And that's why you see the, the so common story of childhood star loses his mind, ends up in jail, is drug addict. And so yeah. it, it's for a reason like it's so easy to get caught up and go down the wrong paths there and a lot of times it's before it's too late you're already so deep into it Mm -hmm. and luckily i woke up to it um largely due to psychedelics but also largely due to the sport of boxing which put me in this different community where it wasn't about fame and money and people using each other, clawing to the top, fake friendships. That's what that whole influencer world was and is. And that's what Los Angeles is. And I feel like a boxing gym is the perfect contrast to LA. LA is everything about like yeah. what you can show and what who you know and what's like, what's fake and what, what you're projecting out in the world. You go to a real boxing gym, no one gives a fuck. Yep. And you still got to put on the gloves and you still got to put in your mouthpiece and you still have to encounter something real. Yep. There's some real shit that's going to happen. Real sweat's going to be dropped on the floor and it's your fucking sweat. And real blood's going to be coming out of your mouth or your nose when you get hit. Mm-hmm. Like it's real. It's real as fuck. So it's a counterbalance to everything that was LA. And you have to earn your respect yep. for your talent and skill mm-hmm. in the boxing gym. And that's not so true in Los Angeles. It's like the the biggest stars there often don't have talent. It's just the the looks that was created actually by a knife. Yeah. So it's And that's this, not to say sometimes people don't have talent. Like my boy Matthew McConaughey, talented motherfucker. Jamie Foxx, talented motherfucker. But But those aren't like Los Angeles based guys. Yeah. I'm talking about like the scene. Yep. And also like under 25. It's a completely different world. Mm -hmm. than that like older Hollywood because the under 25 is like trying to get to places. They're trying to prove themselves. It's like the still has all the high school drama and people are acting like high schoolers, but add in $10 million and 10 million followers to each of them and imagine like what you're going to get. The (laughs) biggest egos in the world. It's like a grand social experiment of how to create something that's pretty uh pretty intensely plastic exactly so it's easy to get lost in that world and i did and and it took me away from my roots of who i was as a kid from ohio who just like loved sports loved playing sports and reset my priorities and my intentions and boxing brought me back to my roots of just like athleticism and -hmm. just being blue collar and working hard and that camaraderie of, you know, having a coach, having brothers. And there's real, that's why I love it. There's so, there's such real, real people in the fight world and the bonds you create within this community of people who have fought for everything that they've had literally and physically or, or figuratively and literally And it was just this, I was able to start to develop real friends and connections Mm -hmm. in that world. And that pulled me out of this other world that I was in. It allowed me to, uh, it forced me to be sober because I was like, oh, I have a fight 
in four months, I have to stop partying and being in this world. And I can't go to these Los Angeles parties anymore. I can't have them at my house. I can't right. film these videos. And even when I stopped filming these videos, I like literally two days later, I had this panic attack of like, what the fuck did I just do for the past two years? Mm. Who was that? Who am I? Where am I? Why am I here? That was such a whirlwind. I never had time to reflect on what I was doing throughout those years. And also I was young. So it's like, you're, you're going to be going and learning and changing and maturing a lot anyways from 19 to 21. But when you're so focused every single day and filming for like 10 hours a day, there's no time to think about your actions. You're simply just doing well, also you're, you're competing by trying to get the most likes and most views. And so you have to be very sensitive to what the comments are, what's going on, what the, what the virality is. And it's creating this very intense effect that I believe the sociologist name is Cooley who coined the term, the looking glass self. So you're actually not actually looking at yourself through your own, through your own heart and expression, but you're looking at yourself through how everybody else sees you. And that yep. becomes a big problem because once you're looking at yourself through how everyone else sees you, then you start to adjust your behavior to fit what will be effective strategy for what they want to see. Yeah. So that, and that's why there, there was this character that I was portraying and it was a lot of acting and hyping up the energy and yelling and laughing when things weren't even funny because I knew that that's what my like kid audience liked. And I saw, and it worked and it worked and I saw the numbers and things were growing. And like you said, it's this never ending cycle of, I need it. How do I do more, more, more viral, more numbers, more views. And so you start to come up with crazier and crazier and crazier ideas. And it's the YouTuber disease that <laughs> many are plagued with. And, and now it's the streamers, the Twitch streamers who have to sit there for six hours and be entertaining on live. And it's like, th this is such a Which bad also thing. means talk the most shit, yeah. say the most ridiculous thing. Cause like video games are not going to be that exciting unless you're actually creating some other external drama. Yep. You know, that's actually you happening. Gotta you have controversial to. stuff, get people tuned in. Kids are diving into their setups and their screens and breaking stuff. And I don't know. It just, yeah, it's crazy. It's the fighting people in the street, antagonizing things, creating beef with their own friends. It's like reality TV gone wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's reality TV doing what reality TV does. So as social animals, we're trained, if we're in a tribe, we're trained to look at potential conflict because conflict could actually seriously undermine and be a detriment to the health of the tribe. Yeah. If there's conflict, everybody's going to look. What's happening? Because we got to resolve this because we need to go out and forage for food and go hunting and prepare ourselves in case our tribe is attacked. And we have to be coherent and solid and we have to have a, a deep solidarity within our community. So we're trained for that. So it's kind of hijacking our natural biology and attention to look at something that's aberrant or chaotic. Yep. And this is you know, one of the challenges because we've lost, we've lost our sense of tribe, but we still have those biological impulses to be trained to look at conflict and be highly interested in it. So this is one of these things as we project into the future with all of this new tech and social media, like we have to be aware that there's certain aspects of our lower natures and also our just base evolutionary biology natures that are naturally going to get hijacked. Yeah, we live in a world and a society where drama runs everything and we're in these negative feedback loops and the hate comments get more likes all the time because people have that and like that drama and like to tear others down and like you said, the, the negative, crazy stories of who's fighting, who's doing this, who's cheating on who, who broke up with who. It's infiltrated our culture on, a, on such a massive level that it's now created this beast that I don't know if it can be stopped. And I was, I was thrown into that beast, you know, due to my own actions. Like I mm -hmm. 
I'm not saying you that. You threw yourself into the I beast. I threw myself into the beast by putting, you know, I was in all that drama and had public relationships and public fallouts. And, um, there, you know, there was 15 of us or 10 of us living in a house together, creating these videos. And th there was always like some sort of drama and we, we fed into it. All of us did sure. because it was working. And, and then, you know, before you know it, you're in that negative loop and you're on TMZ, you're on all of these articles and every single, every single day. And it's mm -hmm. for something negative and they're highlighting the negative. And so it creates this for people who aren't really paying attention and kind of like half know who you are or like kind of half follow the media. They're like, oh yeah, this is this kid and everything that he's doing is reckless, chaotic, out of control. Right. He needs to be stopped. He's probably a bad person. Um, and I definitely did bad things, but I, I was more so like just a lost person, like chasing the wrong things and was super ambitious for other reasons and just, yeah, like went down the wrong path. Yeah. And I mean, to be fair, your wrong path slash bad things are relative on the wrong bad scale. I mean, mostly you're just fucking around. Yeah. You know, like like seriously hurting people? No, no, not really. You know, like really fucking people over? No, not really. You know, like it's not, it's, I, but I appreciate you saying that because it's part of your humility. It's part of you saying like, you know, all, all we were doing was just being kids and having fun. No, you're acknowledging like, no, I could have made better choices. Yeah. You know, and, and all of us could have made fucking better choices. For sure. Who couldn't have made better choices? For you were sure. just making... You were just making less than the best choices publicly. Yeah. So what? Yeah, on a massive like, scale. On a massive scale. Look, <laughs> yeah. everybody look in the fucking mirror. You think you made all the best choices. No fucking way. Whoever you are right now, if you're like, I made all the best choices my whole life, do some fucking ayahuasca. Figure some shit out. I promise you, you're going to see some choices that you made. You're like, damn, I got to send some apologies. I got to send some sorries. And that still happens. No matter how many times, no matter how many times I've done ayahuasca or whatever, 24 years in the plant medicine path and every new time I'll find something and I'll be like, damn, that wasn't a kind thing I said to somebody. Yep. Now, you know what I'm not going to say that about? I'm not going to say that about all the shit I talked to your boy, Brandon. <laughs> I'm going to feel good about that always. Yes. <laughs> always, yeah. And I'm going to keep going. And I'm gonna nonstop. Keep, <laughs> nonstop. And Bringing Brandon down. <laughs> but speaking of Brandon, this is one of the things that I think helped you get out. Brandon is one of the best humans I've ever met, you know, and one of the, one of the purest souls I've ever met, which is probably why it's so fun for me to fuck with him because <laughs> like I have this irresistible urge when I see somebody <laughs> carrying that level of light and goodness. Yeah. That it's fun to fuck with him, but he's, you've surrounded yourself with great people and it's not just, you know, your best friends like Brandon. And it's not just, you know, Lucas Mack, who's also a stunning human being and has guided you through breath work and all of so many things. We'll talk about all of this. But like across the board, the people who are around you, they're just solid people. Like your crew is solid. And all the ideas that people have about the posse, the posse like straight up from your security down to your friends, down to the camera people, down to the other allies you bring in, they're fucking solid human beings, like across the board. And that helps, that's got to help a lot. Well, yeah, thank you, man. And, and it's a f tribe and a family and it's taken a while to build. And, you know, some people get filtered out, but the higher vibrational energy that the whole entire tribe and family has, the, it, it's, it just it starts to attract the right people. And it's been this incredible thing, but it's, finding those friends and coworkers and colleagues who just keep it real with you, yeah. who want to see you succeed, who don't just tell you yes. And there's such a big thing around, around the posse. Look right. at all these yes men. 
My friends talk shit about me every fucking day. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's like, what friends do. Fuck you. You're <laughs> ugly. Like they yeah. keep me in check and vice versa and vice versa. And it's, it's this beautiful thing to also build all of this together because at some point, um, I think a lot of companies or whatever, it's, it's a lot about money and we've basically created this just amazing movement together of knowing what it is that we're going after and changing the course of history. And I think it's united us more as a front and as, as a team. And I believe we're, we have been and are going to continue to do really, really special things because of the group around us and because of the good people and because of the big thinkers and the big ideas and the talent that a lot of these people on the team have. And it truly is this amazing, amazing family. And I'm very grateful for yeah, it. Yeah, man. I think, you know, one of the, so the first time we encountered each other, uh, we were doing tote. Yeah. That's a, that's a hell of a way to start off a relationship <laughs> yeah. because that is the most intense, in my opinion, the most intense psychedelic. Now, it's shorter in duration. You know, probably the whole ride is 40 to 60 minutes. But it brings you to a dimensional reality where you merge with not only source consciousness, but the somatic felt experience in your body of what the only word that you can use to describe it is God. Now, mm -hmm. God is a complicated word, so you can use source, or you can use universe, or you can use capital L, love, whatever you want to use, but it's God. And it merges you with that. And anything that's obstructing your ability to access that, any pain or anything else that's there is going to come up. So <laughs> we went on this fast track of getting to know each other. And, you know, I heard good things from our fellow mutual brother, Lucas Mack. And I was like, all right, I trust you, Lucas. Like you're dialed. Like I know I've watched you work the space. I've watched you. We've facilitated breath work together. Like I know how competent you are at seeing energy and seeing somebody is. So I, I had a lot of faith. And then of course we meet and then pretty soon we're in ceremony. And, you know, I'll let you share, you know, what happened in ceremony. But I remember that you know, when you drop in and we had a, we had a facilitator out where we were and when you drop in, I'm also, you know, I've also been uh, trained to facilitate and I don't do that myself. I always let a, you know, a real seasoned veteran handle the, the main aspect of that, but I help co-facilitate. And I remember like part of what you do is you take some of the dose yourself and then you merge with sympathetic resonance with the person who's taking the big dose. So you take a small dose to help facilitate. And I remember just feeling like, like, fuck, like so much of this guy's energy yeah. like I'm able to share and merge with. And I just had this like keen instinct. I was like, man, there's some real pain in his jaw. And I remember like I laid my head right down to your head and I started like doing like some deep like body work on your jaw and we just, cried together. Yeah, we were both we're crying. Just, we were both bawling. Yeah, that was a that was the a moment where all of the uh you, you you know, you carry all of this pressure in in the position I am in in such a young age with you know, I think maybe in an extended network there's like 200 people working for me, not all of them like sure. solely rely on me, but like mm -hmm. thinking about them and being the captain of yep. that ship. And if it all comes down, it's, it's on me. Yep. Um, and carrying that. The, the pressure and privilege of being a king. Exactly. Exactly. But I think it's taken me a while to, realize the privilege. I think that's like a maturing process because right. everything's happened so fast over the past decade and grown so much specifically in the past three and a half years that a lot of it feels like more so pressure. 
Yep. And I overwork myself. I overextend myself. I think I can do it all. And that's a, that's a great trait. And, and, and I have to step up to the plate to do it all. I like sign yeah. myself up, but it's good. I like that. I'm like, yeah. boom, I'll, I'll fight anybody. I'll do anything. I'll create this company. I'll invest in this. I'll do that. I'll shoot this commercial. This company's going to be a billion. I'll do this podcast. I'll post once a week. I'll be the head of fight relations at the PFL. I have my charity. I'll help Amanda Serrano. I'll sign more fighters. Uh, 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 uh. And then all of a sudden you're like, every day you wake up with 20 text messages that like important ones that yeah. require attentiveness and thought and, and detail and awareness and critical thinking skills. And a lot of times content to come from them. And then you're, you're carrying all of this and uh, it, you, you kind of have to become numb to it to be able to push through. Yeah. And so it, you redact your emotions and your own, you, you're, it's a selflessness because you're not even operating for yourself anymore. You're actually just um, doing things for a higher purpose, which is great, which yeah. is great. But, but in some of those moments, and specifically the toad, that's, I think, all that shit of what you were feeling. Not to mention my own personal journeys of trauma and um, my my childhood and and just even the stuff of the trauma around all the things I went through from like 17 to, to you know, 23 and the media and fallouts and attacks and allegations and lawsuits and uh, falling outs with my brother and just the, the list goes on and on. Sure. I feel like I've lived like 400 fucking lifetimes, <laughs> but, um, you, you carry all these things. And I think in that moment, and I have, I have problems crying. I'm not, I'm not able to cry really because when I was a kid, um, my dad would hit me and then I would like start crying. And then he would be like, yo, if you're crying, if you cry, I'm going to hit you more. And so, the first time I was like kept on crying and then he hit me more. And then I, after that, I was like, fuck, like I, I just can't cry. Yeah. So like, um, I have problems like releasing that and crying is good. Like it's such, it's like, Oh, you're, you're not tough. Like even people make fun of me. Like I was crying in my brother's locker room after he lost his fight. It's like, no, like I'm strong enough and secure enough as a man to cry and more men should cry and it's okay to cry and it's okay to let those things go and you're going to feel you're going to feel so much better afterwards and it shouldn't be this thing that's like frowned upon in our society and um and w women should also like it too in a man like and not not be like oh yeah you're soft yeah um but in that moment on toad, you <laughs> felt all of these things that like yeah, were bro. brought right up to the surface, and and I'm almost crying now. And and if, if like if crying makes you not a man, you got to put me so far on the not a man yeah. threshold. Like yeah. I'm all the way on the other scale because I'm deeply in touch with my emotions, and I understand that there's a time, there's a time for for no fucking tears. There's a time where the king and the warrior have to step forward and say, you know, fall in behind me, no matter what hell is coming, no matter what storm is on the horizon, like follow me, men. And you can't have the king that falls into tears and collapses under the weight because there's a whole host of people who are relying on you to lead and relying on you to provide the resources for their families and their careers and their lives. And then you extend that even further. There's a whole world that's, you know, you have the opportunity and both the privilege and responsibility to deliver the best message of truth that you can to that world. And so all of this responsibility and pressure, there's times where you just can't cry. And, you know, this has also been a challenge sometimes with Vailana and I, because Vailana is like, can you feel me and feel what's going on? And I said, yeah, babe, I can, but I just can't right now. Like I can, I'm capable and I do, and I understand but there's so much pressure right now mm -hmm. that I can't allow myself to drop into the deeper feeling tones of what you're feeling. And, 
And that's like us getting to know and love those aspects of each other because all the aspects are there. The lover aspect, of course, all I want to do is cry with you all day. I would love to just drop into that. But I have so many responsibilities and so I don't have the energy that I can spare and the time that I can spare to do that. I got to step into my warrior, step into my king. And in that, from that place, it doesn't matter what I'm feeling inside. It doesn't matter how broken I am. I got to show up and I got a podcast today. I got to show up and I got to handle this meeting, handle this call, handle this board meeting, handle all of this. I have to do that. I mean, it, there's no putting it off. Yeah. You know, like it's necessary. And, and, I, and I recognize that in you. And so to hear you reflect that, it's one of the things that I think I felt, which is not only, yeah, can I identify the pain? Of course I can. But I can also identify every other aspect. And that's when from that point, and actually when I came to the Anderson Silva fight, you know, a lot of my message to you was about being the good king yeah. and the story of the good king, because I saw that in you. I saw your goodness, actually. And I saw your kingship in the Hebrew lineage, they would call it your melchut. Your melchut is your like your kingship. And I saw that and I saw your goodness and I saw your kingship. And I was like, here's a young, good king. And like your story matters. Yeah. And so to know that your story matters and your story is linked to a greater story of the evolving cosmos as we lead the world into a whole new story all together, not just like we're the only leaders, we're the only kings. No, everybody can tap, tap into their own Melchut and everybody can lead if it's just your family or if it's just yourself. Fuck it. We need everybody to just step forward into a whole new, a new story for a new world. Yeah. And everybody has it in them. And that's why I love to share my story and like what I've went through and all of these things um, because I truly believe that every single person has that good king and that leader and that badass warrior inside of them. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't think I was capable of any of that. I didn't know anything. I wasn't awake. I didn't know I could hold such power or responsibility or amount to any of these things that I've accomplished. Um, I, I'm a regular kid who like my, my, I work hard. Yeah, I work hard and I believe in myself, but self-belief like compounds. So mm -hmm. it starts off with something little. Um, and, and then, you know, once you knock down that, then you can compound and compound and compound it. And then before you know it, you're this like unstoppable force of self-belief and self-manifestation. But I truly believe that a lot of kids are hurting. A lot of people around my age are hurting, are depressed, are lost, don't have purpose, are addicted to their phones, like sucked into social media, um, lacking connection, addicted to porn, are on Tinder looking for all of these things, maybe dealing with addiction, like in, for, with alcohol or drinking a lot to, to suppress a lot of these feelings, which is, I was a lot of these things mm -hmm. and um, pulled myself out of that. And I, that's why I like to like share this story of getting into breath work, getting into meditation, getting into, into boxing, fighting for something and looking to, you know, permeate that one person's soul who can resonate with, yeah. with my story, like being just from a small town, not knowing what a lawyer or a manager was when I moved to Los Angeles, not knowing what an audition was or an acting class and literally just having like a cell phone to create all of this. And I truly believe that if I can do it, then someone who's literally listening to this right now can do it. And also, man, it's, uh, you know, you shared some of the, like a deeply traumatic and challenging story with your father and <clears throat> you shared even more, you know, psychologically incredibly challenging stories and, and no, you know, I don't want to 
bring those up because those are your stories to tell. But it, and it almost doesn't matter. What matters is is that you had to overcome a lot. And we were talking about having a very philosophical conversation. And yeah, when you're put under that much pressure and you have that much trauma, it's going to be really hard. And those broken, it like breaks our pieces of code, like our software operating system. Like if our bodies are hardware, then our mind is our software. And then our soul holds the blueprint for the highest potential of our software and the highest potential of our hardware. Like our soul has like a, a gnosis of this is who you could be. And it draws us forward. Mm -hmm. It's aspirational. It's like the muse. It draws us into our highest potential. But when you go through stuff like that, it breaks some of the code. You know, it breaks some of the code. And then so we have to use the technologies that we have available, which for me have been a lot of the plant medicines, but also, you know, finding the guides and mentors who can help straighten up the code. And of course, breath work is one of the best ways to do it. It's actually... I don't actually recommend everybody go do psychedelics. I don't, I don't, but I recommend everybody do fucking breath work. Everybody. Yeah. For Universally sure. 100 out of hundred people like do breath work yep. and me meditate, find a way to still your mind, go out in nature. These are like universal recommendations and we have to do that. The more that our code is broken, one, that pressure creates adaptations, which can be our superpowers, like part of your ability to close off your emotions and just move forward no matter what, that's a superpower. Yeah. But you also have a whole bunch of broken code yeah. in your software that you got to <laughs> fix. And it's, so it's both. And those are choices that you made. You made choices to fix your code and to, and to use your superpowers, but keep moving forward. Yeah. And, and uh, it's interesting because that trauma and stuff can create, yeah, like you said, superpowers. It's a double-edged sword. And it just learning how to wield that sword of like, yeah. I can use all of this for good, but fixing the bad parts and it takes time and it's, it's scary, you know? And I've even knowing that my brother like went through all this same shit that I went through with our childhood and knowing that like he hasn't started to heal that side of things and he's kind of like put it in a box and like ran away from it um knowing and it's scary is what i'm getting at and he knows that and he says that and, he, and he's not af afraid to admit that yeah. and i think he just hasn't been ready for that to to un open pandora's box because you you go backwards at least my experience is you go sure. backwards before you go forwards, because you kind of realize you have all these other problems. And it's like, yeah, it's I have all eyes these... open awareness to all the broken code and you got to get in the code. Yep. You got to live the code and yep. it'll put pressure. These, these experiences will put pressure on the code so that you can fix it. Yep. But it's still your fucking choice because you can go look at that code, find it's broken and then go, nope, not going to fix it. I'm out, you know, and then you're just aware of things, but you have not taken the initiative to go actually change them. And it's, that's a tough spot to be in. Yeah. And, and it, and it takes time. And if you have that good, like moral compass and good soul, if you know why you're acting a certain way or doing something in real life or treating someone a certain way, or you're getting angry or whatever, and then you're aware of the reason why you're doing it, then that's where you can like start to change it. It's a yeah. practice and it's one thing to know, but it's like reading the manual of like how to build the engine, but then you have to like actually go and do it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the work. That's the integration. And it's a never ending process. It's like going to the gym. I think a lot of people, and, and I think maybe I thought this too, maybe like, oh, I'm going to go do ayahuasca once. And I'm going to be good. Yeah, 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 yeah. You could, like, that's so far off. And people, <laughs> and I think, I think ayahuasca has this, like, reputation of, like, this big, scary thing. And it's intense. And it's like, you're in the jungle. Ooh, tell me about that. And obviously, it's a crazy, magical experience. One of the best things you can experience in life. But I think it just has this bad reputation of being, like, so scary. When it's just, like 
this is what is needed for, I think it gives you exactly what you need. Mm -hmm. It's not going to like overpower you and like strangle you and fuck you up. And I think the people who have maybe bad experiences on it are those who aren't self-aware and then they go into it and then there's just like this mirror and all of a sudden they look at themselves. So like, if you're not self-aware, I think that's where people get scared. But I think for the most part, people are self-aware, but it has this, um, interesting reputation of like, oh, I I don't know if I'm ready for that. Like everyone's, in my opinion, ready for it. But it's like going to the gym. You you have to continue to go. You don't just go and look good overnight because of one gym session. Right. And it's the same thing with breath work, meditation, ayahuasca, toad, the God bomb, like the more hurt you are and the more problems you have, the more you have to get into that gym of self-healing. And it's easy to go back to your default settings of Mm -hmm. how you were. Everything goes back to our childhood. We act the way we act because of our childhood. And that's, it's our default settings that have to be like, you said fixed in that code. Yeah, well, because that's when the code is really being formed. It's the most malleable. Why are kids able to learn languages better than adults? Yep. Why? Because their brain is malleable. Yep. Like whatever you want to reduce it to, BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, like this ability for neuroplasticity, the brain to actually shift and adjust, that's the strongest when we're kids. So these patterns when we're children and when we're growing up, you know, those are the strongest coding patterns that are in the deepest parts of the code. And yeah. so, you know, somebody somebody like your brother, who I don't know nearly as well as you, clearly he's gotten the superpower part. Yeah. Because he went through the same shit. And yeah. I like watching him do fucking backflips off yeah. the top rope in WWE going like, God damn, that's impressive, you know, and what he's done with his life and career and prime and all of that. So he got the first half right because that's another choice because you could allow that pressure that you guys felt to crush you. And both of you, for whatever reason, maybe because you had each other, maybe because for whatever reason, like you guys decided to take that and make it a superpower. And then the only difference is you've gone and done the other part, which is, okay, superpower, check. Now I'm going to go fix the code. Yeah, 100%. You know. And... um. Yeah, he's one of the most amazing people in the world. But I and and I love him to death. And we largely, yeah, like fought through all of our childhood together. You know, so we were in the we were in the same boat. Um, and I think these types of journeys and ex, explorations can help bring people closer to themselves and help create a constant, a more constant state of happiness and gratefulness Mm -hmm. and living a very, very beautiful, beautiful life. Um, And so that's what I want for him. Like that, that's, that's any, and he already has that, but there's another, there's another level to it for sure. One of my favorite memories of you, and and I'd love for you to talk qualitatively about the difference between the different medicines and just your experiences and kind of go into the details of what you felt. But I remember one of my favorite memories of when we were doing ayahuasca with El Dragon at, at, uh, in Soltara. Um, and, and I also just got to mention that, you know, I've gotten a couple reports from people who've gone down to see El Dragon and haven't had good experiences. So we had a great experience. My only experiences with him have been good. I just want to share publicly that I have received, you know, some people who said they haven't had a good experience with them. So I just want to put that out there for what it is, is it feels like my own integrity to receive these. I haven't investigated. I don't know, but it's just, just want to let that be known. But we had an incredible experience. And one of the, one of the, uh, <laughs> one of my favorite memories is we do what to call like a ceremony where everybody shares and you are about to go and the fucking rain 
started coming down so hard that it was a deafening, like yeah. a deafening rain. So you just stood up like an orator, like Cicero back from the <laughs> old days. And you just orated this five minute fucking inspiring speech. Like you were fucking William Wallace. <laughs> and you were like sharing about your journey and experience and about the fucking, the, the fireflies and the whole thing. And it was just like, this is fucking epic. Yeah. Like, this is really cool. Yeah, I have a loud voice when I want to. So I can <laughs> yeah, just I, go I saw that. right over the rain. Mm -hmm. I always, it was my pet peeve in school when like someone would get up in front of the class and like you couldn't hear them. And I'd be like, yo, <laughs> like just fucking, get in there. Get in there. Get your chest voice. Let's go. But yeah, man, uh, that was a uh, beautiful beautiful week um and my first time with ayahuasca and yeah the the first night was was tough um it's like you said it takes this mirror and and there's this motherly essence to the medicine and the the mother starts to show you these things that you did that you need to like look at yeah. in an abstract way. And each time is different, but it's like, it, it paints out a scenario for you. It doesn't show you exactly the lesson because it, it's not like a language. Like yeah. what does mother ayahuasca speak English? No, it's like, it shows you a scenario, if you will. And so it was showing me the scenarios um, of like how I've acted and it brought up like very specific situations mm -hmm. that I had completely forgotten about. Mm -hmm. And it made me take a hard look at um, some of those situations. And the, the big thing was like me being like snarky sometimes to people. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes they'll just like snap. And it's like, why, why, like, why do you do I this? Know, man. I can't tell you how many times there's been like a 20 minute, 20 minute vignette in ayahuasca about some casual moment where somebody was, you know, trying to say goodbye to me or whatever. And I was so busy because I'm on to the next thing that I didn't really like fully make eye contact and like didn't acknowledge them. And, it'll yeah. show, and I'm not even aware that I didn't do that. Yeah. And it'll show me that and I'll have to sit with it and I'll go, fuck and then and, you know get on the you know, make a little note you know in the journal that's all fucking completely scribbled so i don't forget it and be like text so and so tomorrow <laughs> you know it, it can be very specific or very big it can yep. be about fear of death and you can bring you through and i've told all my stories too many fucking times but it's very interesting it'll po it'll point to small things which are indicative of larger things yep. sometimes you move too fast sometimes you're you know, you can be a little bit of a dick. So whatever mm -hmm. it could be, but it'll show you just a little vignette. Like, hey, 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 Jake, take a look at this moment. What do you think about it now? And you're like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and you see it from the other perspective and you're like, yeah. why was I like that? And, 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 you know, going back to like the pressure and all the things going on in the business, a lot of times like it's just those like that little bit of like pressure that sure. you're like taking out on someone. And... I've had the same shit where like people sometimes think I'm ignoring that. Like I sometimes I'll walk into a room and like I don't even say hi to anyone because I'm not even there. I'm in my head like solving problems or thinking about mm -hmm. the texts I need to respond or how do I, what's my positioning here? What's the content idea? What's this? Uh, well, maybe I'm just thinking about boxing and the combination I learned, and, but there's, I'm, I'm in my own world. Sure. Um, and so sometimes, yeah, it's like, why didn't he say hi? Why didn't he say bye? Why is it like, and I kind of have resting bitch face too. <laughs> so like, it's, it's just twice as bad. Like, like, he didn't fucking say hi. And I'm just like, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, it's all these like little things. And, um, and, on the first night, yeah, brought up a, a lot of problems around like self-love and how harsh I am to myself because because that's what I was indoctrinated right. 
to, to be because my parents were so critical of every single thing. Like I couldn't do anything right. And so naturally that's how I treat myself, that own, my own voice in my head, my whole childhood and growing up was like, you, you can't do anything wrong. You can't do this. You can't do that. Yeah. You can't mess up here. What about this? What about that? And it's living in that state of fear and anxiety and you never give yourself any credit or even I would like win the wrestling tournament and it was like, well, why the fuck didn't you do this or that? Like, why didn't you pin him? Yeah. You know, if you want on points or something yeah. like, that, like that. Well, you didn't do this move. You need to work on this. And and that that also created a superpower. There's another right. side to that right. of like constantly striving for more, but it also creates, um, it created a ton of like insecurity and um, self-loathing and judgment that was just too much a lot of times. And it really showed me um, like to just be nicer to myself. And mm. she gave me like a really big hug and it felt like this love that I, I needed. And it it's was the love so, of, it's the love of the mother. Yeah. And it was so it really cerebral like and capital M mother. Yeah. All caps, mother. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was really powerful. And I think that was my biggest takeaway from the the whole week is is working on that self-love and mm -hmm. giving myself credit sometimes. And moving forward for the rest of the week, um, it showed me just like how beautiful life was and kept on painting all of these different amazing things for me to see and witness and experience and feel. And you know, that you, in our society, everything moves so fast and you just always have to do a bunch of things and be here and do this and, da -da 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 -da. and we're so disconnected from nature and we're so disconnected even from ourselves. We're disconnected from the beauty of life and living in the present moment. I struggle with that because it's always like future problem, future thing. Sure. What are we doing? Meeting, 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 meeting. So you're never in the present moment. And Toad Aya has really, really, really helped bring my attention to the present moment and being able to enjoy it and to let everything else go. And I think that's also why I used to drink a lot because it brought me to that present moment, but that's not the right answer. Mm -hmm. You have to, that's a crutch. It's an easy way out and yeah. it always ends bad. And this started to give me the power to be able to just do it by myself every single day with yeah. some meditation and just some thoughtfulness around it. The way to think about the difference between drinking and a well, you know, a well intended and well done psychedelic medicine is in your default consciousness, you're in like a beta brainwave state and you're constantly assessing for threats, problems, opportunities. You're kind of, it's very difficult to drop into the present moment in that brainwave state and just from that default mode of reality. So, one way to get into a more present reality is you can start to close off your aspects of your consciousness and so alcohol closes off aspects mm -hmm. of your consciousness so you become the problems become less significant or aware i mean it can have lots of different problems as well because you're closing off your higher dimensions of consciousness and but it's actually effective it's just not the right best strategy yeah. and it's not that alcohol can't be medicine at certain points too like sometimes like drinking with a buddy is like medicine and sometimes actually I remember the first time I did Toad and I was given a ridiculous dose combined with a ridiculous dose of MDMA. I tell this story in my, in my upcoming book, Psychonaut. It was insane, like 350 milligrams of MDMA plus like 140 <laughs> micrograms of Toad. And it, it was awesome, but I couldn't sleep for three days. Yeah. And I'm like, I am fucking going crazy here. So finally I was like, what am I going to do? And I was like, I'm going to have some drinks. Yeah. And I got out a bottle of 
you know, I think, I don't know, it was wine or whiskey or sake. I don't even remember what it was, but I got out a bottle and I just started having drinks and, you know, a few drinks. And I was like, because my consciousness was actually so high and I was yeah. vibrating so high that I couldn't downregulate. And it just actually helped close a few things down. So I'm not even saying that alcohol can't sometimes be medicine. I think all things. And I'm not saying that psychedelics can't also be drugs, you know, because they can. You yeah. can use them for escape. But these different, you know, these different psychedelic medicines, typically they do the opposite. They elevate your consciousness. So you enter a field where you see reality and you see yourself in this kind of golden light frequency of the truth of how beautiful everything is. Yeah. And, and that's, that's fucking huge. I don't, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be standing here. There's the same person, you know, if it wasn't for those tools. Yeah. It, it, and coming off of it, it's like you feel lighter and just yeah. every day just feels. Instead of a hangover, you got the opposite. Yeah. You got like the aftertaste afterglow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There was, a, there was a moment where like the, all these fireflies are <laughs> in the Maloka and that, you know, they like buzz for like one second. Right. And there's probably like 20 of them. And most of the time during I, my eyes were closed, but I like opened my eyes and I just started looking at these fireflies. And in that moment, one of them <laughs> lights up and starts going crazy, like <laughs> circling around, like, look at me, I'm cool. And he wouldn't, he didn't, like flash dim. on and off yeah. yeah he was just on and he was flying super fast and like going crazy and he was like look at me i'm flying i'm the best <laughs> one here I'm, I'm better than all of y'all and i just like had this voice in my head like Wee! and i'm just sitting there like laughing my ass off at like how beautiful that moment is in that firefly and and how you don't obviously you don't know the, its consciousness or what it's thinking, but like that firefly's life is so important to him or her, and is having a blast flying around in this maloka, and we all just have one life, regardless of how long it is, and um, it sounds like f funny to say, but when you just think about every like little being and how their life matters to them and it changes your perspective sure. on a lot of stuff. And also look, as somebody who's been in the magical realms for a long time, I also am of wide open to the possibility that that firefly had formed some kind of spiritual resonance with you yeah. and was doing that for you. That's what and I'm saying. And actually didn't know what it's doing. Like, I don't know why I'm doing this. Why am I lying out? Yeah. Why am I fucking circling around? Yeah. But because it, because you were actually calling that for it. Because I've seen some crazy magical shit happen in ayahuasca. And one of the things you feel is you feel this sense of connection to the field. Like you and the firefly. And what I'm suggesting is, is you and the firefly may have been in this cosmic dance where that was a relationship that you guys developed in the field that you were tapping into. Yeah. Where that was like, that was something special that God, Source, Spirit, Mother Ayahuasca, all different ways and different windows to talk about the same thing was kind of like just showing you like, I'm here with you and like, this is going to be a cool lesson and it requires this firefly. Well, and, and just the storms that were going on mm -hmm. during those weeks or days yeah it's uh, crazy some of the like most beautiful revelations that i was having and like the energy building together as a collective in the maloka then like the lightning is striking and thunder is rumbling and it was just the most magical magical thing that you can't even explain and unless you you really experience it but yeah i think the whole field is connected even at one point I, I was in my own journey. Then all of a sudden I hear like a girl on the other side of the Maloka, like crying and like screaming in pain. And then all of a sudden there was like this red being that like had this negative energy like came up. It, I it completely like my experience stopped and this like bad energy entered. And I literally like, instantly went into like kill mode <laughs> and I 
started beating the shit out of this thing. <laughs> and it was like life or death for me. Like yeah, I felt sure. like I was in like a real life or death situation that this thing came up and I beat the shit out of this thing <laughs> and it goes away. And then the girl like stops screaming and crying. I didn't know who it was, but like that was trippy as fuck. Don't yeah. I was like, what yeah. the heck? Don't fuck don't fuck on? with our people, says, yeah. says Jake. He's like, come bean? Not yeah. today, motherfucker. <laughs> you fuck with the wrong, you fuck with the wrong Maloka. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's it's interesting with these, you know, and I don't want to get into my whole spiel on how to deal with demons, but one of the strategies is sometimes you gotta fight them. And to do that, you have to have confidence that you're capable of fighting. Sometimes they're just baiting you to fight because that's all they do. And it's like, they're like, you know, the Diaz brothers of fighting. Like the more you fight them, the more they just want to fucking fight. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like it yeah. doesn't matter. Even if you win, they're like, I'm fucking still here. I'll yeah. fight you in the, I'll fight, as we got IVs that going in our arms, I'll still fight you there. Yeah. You know, but so they just want to fight. And still, you can choose to fight. And sometimes there's virtue in that. Sometimes they need love. Sometimes they, you just go, not today. This is too much for me to handle. And like, you just push them out. There's a lot of things you can do, but um, it's, it was cool. I mean, you don't have the veteran experience of all the manner of demons, but you made the right choice clearly in this one. And I think your yeah. instinct <laughs> was for that choice. But I also want to just put it out there. There's some demons y'all don't want to fight. Yeah. I'm just I'm just saying like there's some ways and and I've encountered all different varieties of those different energies. Call them demons, whatever. Demons could have stronger biblical meanings than what what I'm talking about. But those energies, um, but yeah, it's a cool that's a cool story because I've been there myself. There's certain times where you got to say like no, not not today. And then you have your own techniques and technologies. And for you, you know, you know how to use your fists. Yeah. So that was the that was the move. It happened really fast. <laughs> I don't think I would have made been like, let me love this demon. <laughs> yeah. I instantly fought. Yeah. But yeah, one of the other crazy things I just remembered actually that came out of that week. But it, it started with Toad because I did I did Toad first. But yeah. when I went into um the toad journey, I, I instantly went into this like white space and it felt like very loving. And then I went into this like completely dark space and it felt like that's where most of the time was spent in that dark space of like anger and fear and all of these things. And it was like kind of bringing up a lot of those things that I still had to deal with and all of that. So I see this like white and black space. I'm like, okay, like what does all this mean? But then I go into, um, I think it was like a month and a half later into one of the ayahuasca ceremonies. And I have this like massive self realization of sort of what we're talking about, which is like, how do you use all of your trauma and all of the bad things and all the crazy sides mm -hmm. of you and that anger and that, that fear and that edginess, that craziness, that wildness, uh, to your advantage, but also that's where I was like operating out of. And I wasn't operating as much out of a place of love and my love for things. Um, and it was a big key ingredient that I was missing. And I realized that the ultimate warriors or ultimate people or the good Kings know how to manage that duality. Yep. And the, the darkness is is the death. It's the, it's the black hole. It's where energy can get sucked into. And the light is the love and the enlightenment. And I saw this like image of like me being split down the middle of this like loving being and this being who also carries a lot of darkness, but I can use both to my advantage, mm -hmm. specifically in my profession, which is, which is fighting. And I don't think or uh, I, I don't, I don't know if it, it was a 
big realization for me to fight out of a place of like love, love for my family, love for my friends, love for myself, love for the sport of boxing and not just fighting with anger and, and to prove people wrong and right. to show the world. And that's still within me, but it showed me like, this is how you need to lead your life is, is harnessing this duality. And I fast forwarded to the future and it like showed me this vision of my kids and I was like taking them to do their first ayahuasca ceremony. Wow. And my son, it was, showed up with half of his face like painted white and half of his face painted black. That's cool. And in that moment, I was like, this, this is our family's symbol. This yeah. is, this is what we need to embody as men and as people in today's society, it's not being easily controlled and just all love. It's not being just all anger and resentment and hatred and jealousy. It's being able to, to tap into both sides of the light and the dark for the greater good. And I just had this epiphany and, uh, have just led my life now with that. And, and it's been very helpful. Yeah, man. I mean, and this is, we had a big chat about this before the Nate Diaz fight and we'll go tell that whole story. And I want to talk about this a little bit, but like the true integrated man or woman understands that they're neither the black or the white. They're neither, neither the darkness or the light, but they're actually, you know, they're actually the line in between. And that's the deeper wisdom of the yin yang symbol yeah. from Taoism is like, actually where you want to be is actually the line in between both and understand the nature of both qualities. Now there's, I would offer a subtle distinction from what you're talking about in the black, because what you're talking about in the black is actually a shadow quality of the black and a shadow quality of the black is when you're doing something out of awareness, right? Like a sh shadow is something that you can't see. That's the nature of a shadow. So if people are like, oh yeah, this is my shadow. No, it's not. You're aware of it. If you're talking about it, it's not your fucking shadow. Yeah. Like if it's in your shadow, you can't see it. That's the whole point of the shadow. It's outside of your awareness. And so a lot of these shadow qualities, which are hurting other people and intentionally and not being aware that you're hurting them, you know, acting out of reaction or anger, those are shadow qualities. And there's also shadow qualities of the light. Shadow qualities of the light could be spiritually bypassing something and ignoring your animality or getting into your own spiritual materialism. There's shadow qualities of both, but in its purest essence, you know, the light is the impulse to love and merge with source consciousness and merge with the field and spread that love. And the nature of the darkness is actually the nature of our own animality. And we are savages. And I say that in, with the highest esteem, we come from, you know, a lineage of mammals and other beings all across this earth. They don't kill just for food. If you ever watch a cat, a cat is not killing birds and mice because I'm starving and I regret, I regret having to kill this mouse. Really mouse, I would love to let you live, but I gotta eat. No, they like to kill. They fucking enjoy it. It's fun for yeah. them, you know? And there's a part of that that's in it that like we actually, it feels good to be bad. And now that being said, that's in it. So it feels good when you're actually, when you knock Nate Diaz down to the canvas, right? Like it felt good. Yeah. I know it did. Yeah. I know it fucking felt good. When you land that <laughs> clean shot, when you drop someone, it's not like we're boxing and I was sorry to do it to Nate, you know, I was really, I'm really hoping that, uh, you know, that, yeah, maybe there's a part of that somewhere, but no, you're like, no, that fucking feels good. It's like Chuck Liddell when he used to knock somebody out and he fucking flex and scream up in the, up in the sky. Like yeah. it feels fucking good, but you're doing it in a context where there's mutual agreement. 
You're both agreeing to give your best. You're both agreeing to try and hurt each other. So that allows you to express your animality. It allows you to express your badness. Same thing can happen in the bedroom. You can be bad in the bedroom, but it's a it's an agreement. And someone couldn't want your badness. Like, yeah, be fucking bad. Yeah. I want to feel your badness. I want to feel your animality. I want to feel your beast. I want to feel your demon. And like, I want to love your demon. And I want to let my demon play with your demon. But there's always the balance of the light, which is, I love you. And at any given moment, we can break into a giggle. And after any one of these fights, we're going to hug it out. You know, like that's at least my intention. Now, there could be some other shit that happens where that's not available, right? But like fundamentally, you're like, once this contest is over, once this defined thing is over, I'm going to let my bad out, but I'm always going to wrap it in a field of my good. And that's where we start to choose. We're not innately bad or good. When you recognize that you're both, and I fucking fully recognize that I'm both, that's why I'm, I rather enjoy how much I've been fucking with Brandon. It's part of my bad. It's part of my badness. Like, I really enjoy it. He's yeah. so good, and I get to be bad by fucking with him. I just laugh and laugh and laugh. And because we also, we have an agreement as brothers that, like, he knows that I love him, and I do. I love that guy. And with that agreement, all of these things are, are fair bets. Like when he expressed his biggest fear was someone was going to slap him in the face when he's in the cold plunge. I couldn't resist but to slap slapping him, him in the face. face. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't resist. <laughs> yeah. It was too much of a temptation. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and then I laughed and howled. You know, I didn't slap him hard. But like, it was just like, there's an aspect of that that I think allows someone to actually really be good is that we embrace the bad elements of ourselves but we also peer through with our awareness, which is on the line and actually above, because you have that as part of your you know, Instagram profile, you got black glove and a white glove. And we have, we'll talk about the whole fight with Nate Diaz too, but it's the awareness to see all of that, eliminate all of the shadows and then be like, all right, I'm going to allow this. This is where I'm going to allow my badness to express, but I'm always going to, this is where I'm going to allow my goodness to express. Well, yeah, it's a very, it's a very uh, liberating feeling. And that, that's, that's why I share the story is because I think in my generation, there, there's a big um, lack of emotional intelligence. We're not taught it. A lot of us didn't have these conversations with our parents, emotional conversations sure. with our parents. And so it's exactly what you said, like, it's okay to have that bad in you and use it, f you know, and, and use it. it and yeah, and, and make yourself better because of it. And I felt liberated b because I found that out, <laughs> yeah. you know, through these experiences, whereas I was just always painted as this bad kid, bad kid, terrible, bad person, bad person. He's great. The media, the media, the articles, the clicks, this is crazy, chaotic, da 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 and, and finally when I was like, yeah, I can be bad. Mm -hmm. Y'all want me to be bad? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Y'all want me to be bad? I'm about to start beating the fuck out of everybody. <laughs> I'm not even a fight. Oh, well, yeah, wait, wait a second. I am a fucking fighter. Yeah, yeah. I am a fucking fighter. I'm a better fighter than these fighters. I'm a very vicious person. And that's okay. Yeah. And that's okay. And I have the perfect place to utilize that. And yeah. I think every man or woman should find that place. To Absolutely. let it all out because Absolutely. It, ma it makes, when I can go into the gym and just unleash on someone, it helps me be more docile and calm and collected and loving on the other side of things and for the rest of the day. Absolutely, man. And, and this is a, is a young quote that your leaves only stretch to, the he stretch to heaven to the extent that your roots reach down to hell. And to understand yourself as a full spectrum being, a full spectrum man or woman, you got to be able to embrace both aspects. And when you put one of those aspects in the shadow, like, no, I would never enjoy hurting someone. Yeah, right. Of course yeah. you would. But you would also hate it because of your goodness, you know, because that would be a delusion. When you hurt somebody, then you're realizing that you're in the myth of separation. You're trying to believe that that person isn't you living a different life, that you're not connected to the field. So you can't hurt somebody unless there's an agreement to do it and that's your goodness yeah so you're not 
hurting people in the shadow. That's all the sexual predation. That's all of this type of attitude. It's hurting people without an agreement that you're here to hurt each other. Yep. You know, that's starting a street fight, like picking on somebody. Like if you went into a bar and somebody fucking mouths off something and they're just a little fucking average dude, it's not part of your goodness to beat the fuck out of that guy. It's part of your goodness to go like, all right, bro, see you later. And then you got, you got X and you got Drew and they would handle, yeah, that, yeah. They would handle that shit for you anyway. Yeah. But nonetheless, like there's not, there's not an agreement there and it's not actually in your goodness to unleash in that category. Now, if you get just bum rushed by a bunch of people and you're defending yourself, for sure, let it out. You know, when I was in, I've only been in one like real legit street fight and four guys surrounded my car. I won't tell the whole story. I've told it before, but one of them slams my fiance, Caitlin, slams her face into the window. And I just flew into rage. And I went around, I flew around the car. I don't even know how I got around the car, but I maybe like jumped it like Dukes of Hazard style. I don't even fucking know. <laughs> Slid across. And I hit him as hard as I fucking could. And if I could have put my, cause he just slammed my fiance's face into my car window, unprovoked basically. Yeah. If I could have put my face through his head and pulled out his ear, like I probably would have. Yeah. You know, at that point, like I hit him as hard as I could. And then I fought the other guys. Caitlin's on one of their backs. And at the end of it, I'm standing, they ran away. And all I could feel was I can't believe I let them run away. Like yeah. I like if I would have been better, finish I, them. I would finish them. You know, <laughs> and like there's so there's a moment for that. And there's a moment for that, for that experience to come out. But for us in our life, like finding the safe playgrounds that we can allow our bad to be acknowledged, loved, expressed. This is, this is real self-love to me. It's loving all your badness and loving all of your goodness. Because otherwise you're going to be judging yourself. Am I good? Am I bad? Am I good? You're both. Yeah. You're both, motherfucker. You're both. Yeah. Now, what are you going to choose? Yeah. How are you going to choose to live? Are you going to be able to forget your goodness, forget your connection to all of those people around you? Well, hopefully not, because then your badness is going to be in the shadow and then it's going to be actually bad. And that's the big difference. So I think what you're saying and what you've done with the black and white and the black and white gloves, we had a half moon the other day. Yeah. And it was hilarious. We're out playing pickleball where you're just, where you're just like a little bit better than Brandon. On the, on the court. <laughs> so as you were playing like a little bit better than Brandon, my favorite my favorite, one of my favorite moments was you look at the moon and you're like, moon, why are you jocking my style? This yeah. is my profile pic. Yeah. Stop like, copying me. Stop copying me. Trademarked. <laughs> no, because when the moon is half moon, it's like it's my profile black. picture. Yeah, exactly. Half black, half white is, is really funny. Um, <laughs> I'm still going to sue the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Jake Paul sues the moon. Great, great. For, the for you guys want articles, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's hilarious. Um, so let's fast forward then. So I was talking to you about this kind of Dharma, this idea, everything I had about it before the Nate Diaz fight. And I still want to talk about the God bomb deuce, too, so footnote on that, but I want to go right into this because this is on the, the subject at hand. And first of all, before that happened, um, one thing I want to reflect is one of the differences between the Anderson fight and the uh and the nate diaz fight is you still had a lot of great people around you in the anderson fight but it was like a kind of packed and busy house yeah it was like a there was a little bit of chaos yeah for in sure. that place it was like whoa there's a fucking ton of people and then for the for the nate fight things had really quieted down and also i want to make a footnote because i want to stay on this thread but i also want to talk about the tommy fury fight which was a period where you actually you left your own dharma of the black and white and went black, black gloves. Yep. And so, and that was about, as a really dark time in your life. So we got to circle back. To and that. it's so weird that you noticed that because I noticed it in hindsight, like, wow, I was only wearing like black shorts. I, I got rid of the love. Yeah. Yeah. And I was in a very dark place and yep. it was very serendipitous. I don't know, but yeah. Yeah. So like, we're going to circle back there because I think it's important, but let's finish this, this story here. So we go in and it's just me and Lucas and one of your brothers with a camera. And then we're doing uh, breath work and guided, you know, guided meditation visualization. Yeah. And this, this is the night before the fight. Night before the fight. Yeah. And it's just us up there. 
And then I drop into my, my deepest listening. Lucas says some things, guides the breath work as the master that he is. You know, I move around and, you know, part of what I offer in the God Bomb is to offer body work. So, you know, you've been through my body work and so I'm comfortable kind of, but I'm doing it real light now because also your body is keenly attuned. The muscles that are tight are supposed to be tight. Yeah. The muscles, I'm not trying to like adjust anything. Yeah. You know, it's just more like feeling and like feeling the energy. I get to your left arm and I get to your left arm and I just see this flash of you hitting Nate with a left hook and dropping him, like, dr like dropping him hard. It seemed like a knockout, but all I saw was, that was just my mind yeah. imagining what that was. But I was like, oh, you fucking dropped him with the left hand. Cause that's what I saw. And so we wrap up, we finish up and I go, hey man, just want to tell you, I was on your left hand and I saw you dropping Nate with the left hook. And you go, bro. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the same shit. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. During the meditation, it just kept, it was like left hand, left hook. The left hook is going to be the, the game changer in this fight. And I know normally you don't like say your visions or whatever it is mm -hmm. or like no, what you experience. Not, no. Exactly. And so it was just, it was, it was actually awkward for me. Yeah. And I actually didn't know if I should say it, but yeah. I was like, this was really clear and really unusual. Yeah. So I was like, hey, man, take this for what it is. But I saw this and you're like, me too. I was like, oh, damn. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. And it, it, it was it was super trippy and surreal. And in that moment, I was like, okay, like, this is definitely going to happen. And, and so many things were in perfect alignment, like the energy of the camp, the house, the buildup, the press conferences, everything was in this perfect alignment you could just feel the win yeah it, it, was, it was just right there and like reality was just sort of catching up yeah but the trippiest part <laughs> the trip well the trippiest part so then we go through we go through and we're talking and we're sitting down on the couch and we're talking about all kinds of stuff some hilarious stuff the boys telling fucking hilarious stories yep. like lucas friends telling hilarious fucking like crazy wild stories yep. doing meth with lady boys and like it's fucking <laughs> it's just a hilarious time but we're also talking about <laughs> this same you know what i call the dharma the same ideas i was sharing about the black and white and how significant it is and what a good choice that is and like how important it is and then a black well you can tell this part of the story yeah so we also just so happened to be sitting in a living room surrounded by black and white paintings yeah hung on the wall coincidence nope <laughs> and i'm sitting next to aubrey and his left hand is like extended on the couch almost and this is one in the morning on a very well lit in a very well lit living room yeah because you're yep. going to bed late, you got a late fight, so that's yep. part of your program. Yeah, staying Not up like you're late. fucking around, like that was the plan. You had your time to eat was like midnight, yep. and your bedtime was later. So I'm staying up with you. Yeah, so we're and and it's always good to laugh before fights and For just sure. like forget that the fights the next day. So good to have that camaraderie. And Aubrey's hand is like on the couch, almost as if it were like around a girl. Um, and m my head is kind of like right by his hand, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere this butterfly is like flying around and lands directly on Aubrey's left hand. <laughs> and I like move my head like five inches closer and it's a black and white butterfly. <laughs> and we're all just like, well, oh my gosh. Oh man. If you don't need, if you don't like if, the universe just is always winking at you if you if you take notice to it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just felt so much peace and ease in that moment cuz it's like first of all like our butterflies like even in Texas like that at night? At night? Inside? Inside? How did it get inside? <laughs> There's no doors open. Yeah. Like it flew in when someone opened the door for 3 seconds. Okay. Yeah. And just so happened to land on your on my left, left hand. hand and it was moments after we were talking about what we had just experienced yeah. in the meditation and us both saying like, yeah, it's going to be a left hand. Yeah. And it was so funny. 
Because I'm just like, yep, that's a black and white butterfly. And you're like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then like, you start pointing to the butterflies that you have tattooed all over your body. Yep. You know, and like all of these different, all of these different synchronicities. So, all right. So then fast forward, fast forward to the night of the fight. Yeah. Right. So you get to bed. We had, and we had just a fucking great time. As far as like taking the pressure off and just laughing, like, that was 10 out of 10. It was like just epic fun. And also that crazy mystical experience. But so we're going into, we're going into American Airlines Arena in Dallas and you're, ro you're rolling in on a tank. Yeah. <laughs> And for those of y'all who don't know, a tank is not what you think a tank is. Yeah. It's way denser. It's way more intense. Yeah. Like you don't fuck. You think you know what a tank is? Oh, I've seen tanks. I watched fucking movies. You don't know what a fucking mm -hmm. tank is. I promise you. You don't know a tank until you've seen a tank. That shit's crazy. And it has such a powerful engine oh. and just like a roar oh. to it. Like it's yeah. insane. And it just smoked out the whole parking garage yeah. with yeah. its exhaust. This is not an environmentally friendly machine. No. This, no. Is not, this is not. This is on the. This is on the black side yes. of the of the, uh, of the equation here for sure but it was fucking cool you yeah. had better on it you come in on the tank it was like an epic <laughs> epic thing so we go through that but security maybe because they're rattled by the tank or whatever they're like giving all kinds of static to lucas and hella and i just like jedi and they were giving static to me too they're like you can't come in you can't come in with the bag you don't have a wristband i'm like i'm coming through i'm going through i'm going to the locker room and they're like, no, you know, I, was, I just kept walking. I was like Jedi mind trick. I was like, I'm fucking going in the locker yeah. room. And so I get in there a little bit before uh, Lucas and Hella were able to actually, Lucas was able to get into the, the locker room. Hella stays, you know, usually stays outside. That's uh, Lucas's partner. And so I'm in there and you go, I'm ready to drop in. And I go, okay. Well, I don't know exactly what Lucas leads you through, but I was like, I'm going to trust you to guide your own breath because you know how to do your own breath. So I'm not going to tell you how deep you want to go because I can obviously guide breath work, but I don't know what your program is and what that is. But I know, you know, I'll be there for you. Like I got you. And so you're laying down on the couch and dropping in. And I, you know, I guide you through a few things, but I remember the most powerful thing that really came through is I was like, I want you to anchor from this moment right here us on the couch and me saying, you know, go from this moment to the moment where you walk back in this locker room and you see me and we have a big fucking smile on our face and both of us just scream the left hook. Yeah, literally. The left hook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was like, anchor from this moment to that moment yeah. and make that as real as possible. Feel the joy of that moment. See my face. Like see us like in that fucking celebrating, the, celebrating, left hook. celebrating the left hook. Yep. And uh, yeah, it brought me a lot of peace in that moment. I was definitely a bit nervous per usual, but um, that, that like brought me into the time in the right timeline mm -hmm. and sort of the nerves went away after that, which was really, which was really powerful. But yeah, sure enough. Fifth round. Sure enough. Put him down with Walk the left the dog. hook. <laughs> Put him down with the left hook. A couple more inches, he would have fallen off onto the... Through the ring. Yeah, onto the, the table. <laughs> in in like a full Logan Paul-esque, yes. break the table yes. outside of the fucking cage, outside of the ring. Yes, Knock, yeah. knocked him out of, the, out of the ring with a left hook. And the left hook also being one of the most effective punches of, of the fight just in general. So yeah. it was just, it was just trippy. And then sure enough, as soon as I walk back into the locker room, you're the first person I see. Yeah. And we go, the left hook. <laughs> and, you, and then like brilliantly, somebody captured a photo of that. So yep. the photo that you posted in the gallery is us screaming the left hook. And another interesting part of that was your left boxing glove is the white glove. Yeah. The and glove. what I was saying, it was like, Listen, all respect to Nate. He is a fucking legend. Yeah. And he fights from the dark energy. Yeah. Not the shadow dark energy. I think he's very well aware. And like, I don't think he's a bad guy, but I, he fights from the dark energy. And he has, and from, I don't know Nate, but it doesn't seem like he has the full, well rounded picture of the connection to the source field, the, the collapse of the myth, the separation. He's fighting from the dark, but you're fighting from both. And so you have that viciousness where you can meet him in the intensity of that. But the difference is, is that you have your goodness. Yeah. And the goodness is going to be the difference in this fight. Yeah. 
and, and that love is so powerful as yep. well. And you need both. You need both in the ring because it's it's the hardest thing in the world, one of the hardest things in the world. And you can't just operate with half capacity, half yeah. emotion. You need all those emotions. And I've experienced not having both. And and so that was the Tommy, that was the Tommy Fury fight. So yeah. let's go there. Yeah. Because, you know, and first of all, we've talked about it and it's like, mad respect to Tommy. He showed up. He's a better man that night yep. and all this. There's no part of you that's like, oh, he really I, showed up. He fucking showed, he showed up. up. He had a great fight and he won. Yeah. Yeah, fair and square. Um, kudos to him, and it, it makes the rematch exactly very exciting. Um, but that, yeah, that was a fight where there was a lot of. I was yeah, I was operating out of a place of darkness and had to learn a lot about my ego and like just tr thinking. I can beat everybody no matter what's going on in my life. And no, I'm I'm stronger and mentally tougher than all this shit. And thinking I could skip on preparations. Um I don't know if I yeah, I don't know if I've shared it uh publicly. I don't think I have. But yeah, I was going through exclusive. Yes. <laughs> exclusive, exclusive. Read all about it. <laughs> Um, yeah, was going through a breakup, uh, during that, that lead up to that fight, um, which just complicated so many things. And I, and I was, I was dealing with it, you know, but not dealing with it in necessarily the proper ways. And so I went home for Christmas to like be around family, you know, bring the vibes up, bring the energy up, yep. laughter good family spirit. Unfortunately, uh, everyone in my family like drinks all the fucking time. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like hurting and I'm like the only one who's, I'm trying to stay sober. It's like, okay, this fight's probably coming up. It wasn't for sure signed. And then, you know, one thing leads to another. Um, I start like having a few drinks and it led to a lot of drinks mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, that's, and I was like, okay, this is how I'm going to deal with this. Like, this is helping. This is like numbing it for a second. And, uh, this was like seven weeks before the fight was just in this dark place of healing and, you know, trying to fix it with, with, escaping it from with alcohol mm -hmm. which was terrible and um it weakened it just like weakened me and my energy and my aura and my training and i had to learn how stupid that was like yeah. in hindsight it seems so obvious but it's like oh like it's just tommy fury and he's never been in a big fight and he's going to get nervous and he doesn't hit that hard and I knock down and knock out everybody. And, uh, yeah, learned, learned the hard way that like going down that dark route just had so many consequences and it, it it's, it wasn't smart to, to mix all of those things together because mentally I wasn't in the right place. Yeah. I don't care who you are or whatever you, you can't, I believe you don't, I, I don't think you can go through a fight training camp, which requires the most amount of physicality while also you're like trying to heal mentally from mm -hmm. this, from being in a serious relationship and breaking up and all your mind's not sure. in the right place. Your heart's your heart's a muscle. Yeah. So if your if your heart is hurting, it's going to take so much energy away from the physicality side of things. It wasn't getting as good trainings. I think all like drinking, my immune system weakened. Like ended up getting really really sick with COVID. Yeah, the list goes on. But like, 
um, was also it? you had you also had you know there's a certain point where your fears are always there and you dealt with one of your big fears which yeah. is you know this wasn't a casual relationship yeah. like you really loved her yeah for you sure like deeply loved her and for it sure. was deeply difficult the way that it ended it yeah. wasn't like a smooth conscious uncoupling kind of moment yeah it was hard yeah it was real hard so that's one biggest fear type of moment and then somewhere lurking underneath all of the confidence and bravado which is important is also the fear what if i lose for sure what if i lose under the bright lights for sure and I almost kind of like self manifested it in a way because I was like, ah, like, what would the universe like do this to me? Like, would I have to like break up with someone and then be all confused? And then that was a huge fear of like having to start from scratch and just like be single and like be mm. in that world again. And, and then losing a fight all happening at once and i was like i know i'm not mentally good but like i tried to suppress it and put it down and you just can't cheat the game yeah and you turn to you turn to something that you could thought you could rely on which was your animality the black shorts yeah you know it's like all right i'm gonna rely on my viciousness yeah my viciousness is gonna carry you through and and that's a super understandable move because the access to the love your heart's broken man yeah like your heart's broke. So what are you going to bring into that fight? Well, I'm going to double down. I'm going to double down on the black. Yeah, exactly. And I'm going to be vicious enough and strong enough that I'm going to hurt him enough. And it just so happened that Tommy was good enough where he's like, that's not good enough, bro. Yeah. Like you're going to have to reassess, come back. And that's what I'm excited about the rematch because you're going to be wearing those black and white shorts. Yeah. And hopefully it's not in some crazy fucking country so I can be there with yeah. you and then uh, and, and lad my energy for whatever small amount or medium amount, whatever it is, or no amount at all. But like, you know, I'll be there with you. And, and that energy will, I think that energy will be the difference and you'll see for sure. a different result. And I noticed the difference in the Nate Diaz camp. I felt like for the Tommy Fury camp, I was just didn't like boxing, didn't care. Training was bland. There was no fun laughter. We were in a foreign country, not at home. You don't have your dog. All these like little things start to add up and it sucked the soul out of the sport. Yeah. And there wasn't that love. And I think everything needs to be like in that perfect balance. And I brought that back for the Nate Diaz camp. And it was almost like in the locker room with Tommy, I, I like knew I was going to lose. I could mm. like feel it. Mm. I could seriously just, it was like, and it was like, I couldn't do anything about it to change it. Yeah. I, I, and I just like felt this impending energy of doom. Damn. And I was like, I'm still going to do my fucking best. Of course. That's what the warrior does. You go out on your shield, bro. Yeah. But, but I, uh, I could feel it. And my coach, you know, one of my coaches told me in, in hindsight, he's like, yeah, like I could feel it too in that locker room and when you got into the ring and it, yeah, you can't, you can't, I guess, change destiny or, or whatever well, I it mean, is. There are wizard moves that could be made, but those wizard moves have to be done by, by wizards. Yes. And, <laughs> and like, that's the reality. And, yeah. and you can, you can become the wizard who can be like, I sense this, I acknowledge it. Let me through my power of alchemy, create a different energy, you know, and, and like, it is possible. Yeah. But, but you have, but you can't, you can't actually, without actually doing some alchemical process, some wizardry move where you acknowledge it and you're like, we're going to fucking transmute it with all of the power of our belief and all of the help of all of the guides. Like we're going to turn this fucking energy and it doesn't even guarantee success, but it's like, yeah, you got to make some, you got to make some real, real moves because there was none of that in the Nate Diaz camp. I mean, like, I remember the music. I remember like, almost dancing as your, as your shadow boxing. I remember just the whole energy of the whole Com thing. Night and fucking day difference. Yeah. Night and day difference. And uh, it, it compounds, you know, that, that positive energy and that negative energy. And yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it was, it was tough, but it, I also am, happy it happened because it's made me a better man and we were talking about that like you need that foe 
that enemy, that opposition yeah. Yeah. to be there every single day to make you a better person. A lot of people like hate their enemies or hate their competition. I, I love Tommy Fury for beating me and mm -hmm. I, I respect him and I'm thankful that he's now reinstilled this fire in my belly. And it's not like, it's not like I got fucked up. It's split decision, put him on the canvas, yep. all of these things. So it's like when I'm at my best, I know I'm going to beat this guy, but <laughs> he, he has made now made me every morning when I wake up, he's like an impending energy yeah, for sure man. that I know I have to be in the gym and to get better and better and better. And so I'm thankful for that. And thankful for my if only, biggest if, if only If only Brandon was a little bit better, he could be that for you. <laughs> Out on the pickleball court. If he was just a little better, yes. he, could, he, could, he could bring that out I would think about Bren, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the funny part of this is Jake's not even necessarily agreeing with me. I'm just continuing. Yeah. I'm just continuing along this line. I unfairly got thrown into this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. And so now Brandon, Brandon has you as the person that yeah. he's going to be thinking about yeah. every time he plays a paddle sport. And, uh, that's hilarious. But yeah, so I, I, I lose and, um, Yeah, very, it, it was like, oh, it was, it was freeing in a way because it was like my two biggest fears uh, basically had happened all mm -hmm. in the span of like three months. Um, so there, there I was on the other side of it. Yeah. Like, how am I going to deal with this? And you're how, still alive. How am I going to respond? Yeah. And it was funny because I, the next morning I was in my hotel after the loss. Like everyone's kind of packing up. We're getting ready to leave. And I'm looking down at the city and I see like thousands of cars on all these different highways, just driving, continuing to go about their lives. And I was like, this literally doesn't matter. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Everyone's gone on with their lives. Yeah. If I can like mentally let this affect me or think that it's like some crazy thing or weird thing or bad thing that I went in there and like did my best and lost when this kid has been doing it since he was six years old and like let it mentally affect me. I think a lot of fighters go down that yeah, route. Sure. It's like life goes on, brother. It's a new day. Yeah. Time to grow from it and get better from it. And it, the, easier said than done. There was moments where I'd wake up and feel lost. And sure. I would be like, damn, you know, um, what am I going to do about this? This sucks. This doesn't feel good. You know, what's next? What's next? And at the same time, still healing from uh, what had happened, you know, in the, in the relationship and just healing in general as, as a person still and on that journey. And I remember I was on a run like 10 days after, cause I got right back in the gym, like the next day mm -hmm. after the Tommy fight. And I was on a run like 10 days later and finally I I felt liberated because I was running and I was going fast and it was the end of the run and I was just like in this badass mood and I finished the run and I look up into the sky I'm like is this all you got mm. is this all you fucking got mm -hmm. is this all you have for me this is nothing <laughs> and at that moment I was just freed like yeah. I I've I've faced everything in life now yeah loss mass like heartbreak scrutiny allegations lawsuits public humiliation um all of these things all of these things and it's like what i don't think life can throw anything at me and brandon said to me he's like hey like bro once you get past this you're gonna be invincible yeah 
And, and and mad respect to the crazy creativity of life that may throw some more crazy shit yeah. and, bl and blessings and prayers that it doesn't. But yeah. nonetheless, what you're saying is very is very true. Like you've dealt with so many different things and so many different vectors. Yeah. And the you know this so it reminds me of two things. One is there's a quote from Carlos Castaneda, and it says, "Death is the wisest advisor that a warrior has, because when he thinks that all has lost, he can ask death." Is that so? And death will reply, no, I haven't touched you yet. Right? Yep. It's like, and so it's this idea of like, oh yeah, I'm still alive. Like, and so you ask your death, death, you know, is, it, is, this, is this it? Is this the end? And death goes, no, nah, I haven't touched you yet. Yeah, You're exactly. still alive, bro. And there's like a beautiful wisdom in, in that understanding. And I think all people who enter the warrior life you know, and when we go through these challenging things, like you can ask your death and just know that as long as you still draw breath, like the warrior's heart still beats. Yeah. Like it doesn't end. Yeah. And your problems are only as big as you make them. Yeah. It reminds me too of what my mom, you know, so my mom was a semifinalist at Wimbledon. You got to meet her last yeah. night at the RFK dinner, which we should touch on as well. But she, uh, she, you know, I would get really nervous before like the big basketball games and be really hard on myself. I didn't play a good game or we lost. And, you know, we had big crowds. It's Texas, you know, high school sports. So we get a couple thousand people at our big games. And um, so she goes, listen, one thing, Aubrey, that, you know, I had to learn as a tennis player is that nobody really cares as much as you think they do. Yeah, exactly. in the stands they're there for the spectacle and they're going to be rooting for you and they're going to be cheering for you but later on that night they're going to go home they're going to laugh they're going to fuck their girlfriend or boyfriend and they're going to like they're going to move on mm -hmm. and we all we imagine that they're like just caring and obsessing and i suppose sometimes in some sports there are people like that who are like i'm going to fucking shave my head until the Jets win a Super Bowl. <laughs> it's like it's like they they get a little obsessed. So I'm not saying that that doesn't exist as well, but fundamentally, most people just you know it's a disappointment. It sucks. It's hard, and especially the closer you are to the people who are there because you care for them. But most people just move on with their life, just like all the people driving, just like all the people watching, you know. And and it just kind of takes some of the pressure off and realizing like this is still a game that I'm playing. It's a game that's designed to help prepare me for the bigger game. And I think that's a perfect segue to, you know, the RFK dinner last night, because that to me is, this is the big game, you know, and you went in very, like, very fair. And like, you're like, I really like what Vivek says. And you even told RFK that. Yeah. And RFK was like, yeah, I understand, you know, and like, I respect him as a, I respect him as an opponent. And, but you got to see and feel what Bobby Kennedy stands for too. And just be a witness and be a part. And actually, was showing Bobby how to run his run his Before Snapchat, run a, yeah, TikTok, <laughs> yeah, and just tip, teach TikTok. him how to do the videos and stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's doing hilarious. Video replies is fucking a, a hilarious, beautiful moment, but and also shows that Bobby's he's just a type of person that's willing to learn, like willing to listen, yeah, and just share from his heart. But I was curious to hear like what your impression, having not known too much about him, and just getting to spend some time with him. We had dinner together. You know, we shared some time before. So what was your, you know, what were your overall thoughts? No, I thought, I thought he was amazing. And I was, I was impressed, very impressed with him as a person, his stories, um, and a lot of his sentiment on what he wants to change and where the problems are in America and where they lie. And I, I share a lot of the same viewpoints and I share a lot of the same viewpoints with Vivek as well. Mm -hmm. And I think, Oddly enough, Vivek and Bobby say a lot of the a lot of the same things, um, and I was just like, "There's there's obvious differences, obviously, but um, but it was so crazy hearing all of his stories and his knowledge on American history mm -hmm. and how in depth he understands." what happened to our country and why and what that led to and how things unfolded. And I think that's a super, super, super important, uh, obviously characteristic for the president to, to yeah. really know 
every single thing that's led us up until the, till this point. Um, but he really listened to me and what I was having to say and the, the problems I think that a lot of our generation deals with and a lot of what he said about the autoimmune stuff and the, you know, why are there so Chronic many kids disease. with yeah. all these diseases and it's the food and, uh, you know, the vaccines and the phones and the, all these EMF protection and all these things. And, um, you don't see these. Glyphosate and he like listed, there's like 10 things we got to look at basically saying there's 10 things we got to look at yeah. that happened somewhere in the late eighties yeah. that contributed to this massive spike in chronic disease. And, he wants to go on his first day as president, walk down to the NIH and be like, all right, here we go. Now we're going to study the real causes of these things. Yeah. Fuck your funding sources. Fuck this. Yeah. Like we got to investigate all of them. And I think people, people will say, oh, all he cares about is vaccines and all his all conspiracies. Like, no, there's, this is one of 10 things that have contributed to an environment that's clearly causing people to be sick. Yeah. And, and you can feel how much he cares for the people who are sick. And like, that's his goodness. Yeah. And he, and he didn't, he didn't feel like a politician, which is right. great. Like a lot of the presidents are always just like pandering or telling people what they want to hear. And I liked how he would like tell people in the crowd, like, I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. know about that. Uh, I don't think that's the right answer. Da, 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 da. And, and having that honesty is, is key. Honesty is the, the key to everything. And it's just been so lost in media and our generation and people are, I, I don't even know if I've like spoken in depth because people have seen me with like some of the presidential candidates and Vivek now RFK. And it's like, why is it? Oh, Jake Paul. Oh, what the fuck does he know about anything? Mm. <laughs> uh, but I've always cared about politics. I've just never chose to, get involved because it's also going to be very polarizing and piss off a lot of people if you support a certain subsector sure. or on one side and in the business I'm in, people can ostracize you, limit you, shadow ban you, block your videos yep. for simply choosing one side or the other. And it's happened to me. It's happened to me. So... I've never really like wanted to get involved, but now I feel it's, it's such a big, important thing for me using my platform to educate kids on why it is so important to vote, why all of these things in our country are going wrong. And I think a lot of kids are asleep to the fact that their vote matters and that uh, we're, we're in a crisis of a time. We're, we're in yeah. one of the worst places in American history currently. And I don't know if people re even realize that, or they are so worried about their own problems that they don't have the time to care about what's going on outside of their own world. And so this is why I've chosen a, to like, finally, I'm going to use my platform to support the candidates that I believe should be in office. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think we're on the verge and on the brink of madness we are and and the analogy that kind of came up um metaphor that i used when we were just talking i hadn't thought of it before but we're in a time where like before a tsunami or a tidal wave the water retreats deep 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 like far far deeper than a low tide right and so so deep that it could expose the coral reefs and so there's a bunch of people who are just on their fucking phones if they're at the beach and don't even notice don't even fucking notice that the water has just retreated super deep. But some people paying a little bit more attention are like cruising down and looking like, whoa, look at the coral. Oh my God, look at this coral. This is amazing. Super low tide today. Yeah. Oh, fucking cool. <laughs> AI, amazing. Look at these generations that I could do. I can fucking write my homework with ChatGPT. Amazing. Yeah. Coral reefs. It's fucking beautiful. And not realizing that the water is retreating and there's a fucking tsunami coming. And yep. there's some people with the awareness to see like, no, 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 no. What you're seeing is the, what you're seeing is the coming tsunami. Yep. And we got to be aware of that. And it's a tsunami on many different fronts. You know, there's a tsunami of, you know, whether you want to look at China that's buying up all of the resources in the world and aggregating a locus of power as we spend all of our money on the military, they're spending all of their money as a, oddly as a communist country, they're becoming 
the capitalist leaders of our world yeah. and aggregating all of the attention because world economics is one of the things that people care about the most. So they're, they're have a 10th of military that we do. We don't have to worry about that, but we should be worrying about like, they're buying up all our shit. They're buying up all the world. Okay. So let's, and Bobby highlighted that to me and I was like, yeah, you're fucking right. And I love Bobby's attitude too, which is like, fair enough. That's a fair, they're playing a fair fight. They're not cheating. We just need to actually find our own strength and find our own economic power, you know, adjust some things with energy and where we, where we get resources, but actually find our power and the ability to use our resources in a positive way and compete. Let China be Tommy Fury and let us be like, all right, bro, like fair, fair. Like now let's see what we can do. Yeah. And, and it's needed now more than ever. It needs a, a savior. Mm -hmm. uh, a literal savior um, and someone who the whole entire country can get can behind, behind because there's too much division you know yeah. it's it's if certain people get elected into the office it just creates division on the other half and we aren't the united states of Correct. America it's we literally are the divided the states, of states of America and yeah. it, and we're falling we're falling um, clear as day. And I believe that this election has the opportunity to change that all. And, and I think a lot of kids maybe don't have the time to look into all of this or care about this or understand why or how it affects yep. we either lives. We either meet the fight out in front of us or we wait for it to come at our doorstep. Yeah. You know, it's like once it's at our doorstep, it might be too late. And that's why I'm trying to like fucking ring the alarm and ring the bell and stand out as early and as and as loudly as we can, because the more that we can get ahead of this, just the more options we have and the better chance we have to quell these tides of momentum. Yep. Because it's going to happen one way or another. There's no, there's no, yeah, we're just cruising along, bouncing around. Everything's cool. 20 years from now, it's like, oh yeah, it was annoying. These lockdowns are annoying. And no, no, it's not like that. Like there's a full totalitarian move that's underway, trying to ban things, censor things, keep one side of speech available and the other side not. And then all of the people who are disenfranchised because they can't share their viewpoints and the corporate capture and then AI and technology and deep fakes and the epistemic commons being fucking completely polluted because, and I loved also what Bobby said is like the solution to bad information is more information. Is like actually allowing information, but as soon as we start censoring information, then we're not going to be able to make sense of anything. Yeah. And so here's the time, man. And I just really deeply appreciate you. It's not the right career move for you to be political. It's no, not. It's not, it's not it's the not, right career it's, move. It's going to hurt. It's going to show course. up. It's going to show up in ways that I don't even know yet. Yep. You know, maybe people secretly hating behind the scenes, but enough, enough of people being condemned for their political choices. Right. It's fucking bullshit. Right. This is a democracy and you're going to get mad at me for having an opinion and voicing that. It's like, that's what's wrong with right now. Yeah. Why, why can't I respect you and your decision and your choice, but these people aren't playing a fair game anymore. Yeah. It's, I have a big company and look at that kid, Jake Paul out there, trying, you know, opposing my opinion. And he has 75 million followers of, of young voters and they, they will follow him. We have to silence this kid, suppress him, call everybody, mm -hmm. you know, don't, we can't let him in here. We can't let him do this. And it's these dark forces that can and do have power and will, and they will get to you. But I, I don't care. And someone said it yesterday. It's like, I'm going to die standing on my feet versus like begging on my knees. Yeah. I don't, I don't give a fuck. I'm here. I'm here to, to make the, to do what's right, to do what's right. And if I need to lose, if I'm going to lose tens of millions of dollars because I'm going to support a certain candidate or be on a side, I don't give a fuck anymore. So what that compounds to in the long run is 
way more important than my financial thing. And that's why a lot of celebrities are scared to say anything and do what's right because they feel trapped. And it's this terrible cycle that we've been in and it's this never ending thing. But now if I'm going to, what happens is I voice my opinion and my support and it's going to let other kids yeah. who maybe were scared ride along with me and maybe f- start to feel the courage to voice their opinion. And as soon as we live in a place and a democracy in the United States where we can have different viewpoints, but still love each other and realize that we're one. That's the day I look forward to. That's the day where we are back to being the country that we started off as. And we are so far from that. And like I said, it's going to, it's going to take a savior and it's going to take a president that doesn't divide everybody. And I think, um, I think Bobby has that quality for sure. Absolutely. Long live the good Kings. Yeah. Long live the good Queens. Long live the warriors who are willing to stand out and say there are worse things than death. Yeah. Like, and if this is my time and my way, it's like Bobby, you know, his uncle and his father were killed for trying to stand for similar things. And he's, and when I asked him like, aren't you afraid that the same fate awaits you? And he says, he just looks at me, he goes, there are worse things than death. There are worse things than death. Truly. And, uh, and that's, this, that's the spirit. That's what we see in every great heroic tale and every great story is those who say there are worse things than, than my death. And, it's, and I'm willing to stand for it. So I honor you, my brother, and I stand with you in, in every fucking victory when we're screaming about a left hook maybe next time yeah. it'll be the right hook maybe yes. it'll be a liver shot who knows yes. who knows what vision will come we'll figure we're it like, out the liver shot <laughs> and, and the butterfly will come and land on your liver <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly so whatever it is i'm there for all the triumphs and all the all the hardships and uh and to the end my brother it's been um you know i know you and i see you and I love you. I love you too, man. And thank you for being such an amazing person who's changing the world so much. And and uh, you don't even realize the effect, I think, that uh, how powerful you are. And you've changed my life so much and have been that like brother figure to me and just helped guide me in the right direction and helped me rewire that code <laughs> and, yeah, man. and to be there for me in, in hard times and the good times and the fun times. And it's been amazing getting to know you. But... Um, yeah, I'm just grateful. Yeah. So thank you, man. Onward. And tonight, Sweat Lodge with La Waira. I don't know if she's in here still, but but we're off. She's probably tending the fire. Woo. So let's go. First experience for you. Let's go. Let's Three hours go. in the Sweat Lodge. Yep. And you'll probably last just a little longer than Brandon. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Uh. <laughs> I love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Peace. <laughs> Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.